today I'm going to be talking about suicide in older adults. And um, I have a few different objectives for this talk. So one is to provide an overview of suicide rates in older adults, both in the United States and the whole world, like different areas of the world. Um, name potential risk factors for suicide in older adults, including race, you know, demo other demographic factors, age, stuff like that. And then also look at possible preventative measures in high-risk elderly adults um, and some future directions. Right. Okay, so a note on the role of culture and demographics on suicide. So suicide really does follow a cultural script. It varies quite a bit across cultures and across different demographics. So in different ages and different races within a culture, it can vary quite a bit. And it's important to be aware of these different risks in different groups because it may have implications when you're assessing a patient for their risk assessment. And also it may also affect your choice of intervention. All right, so this is, I think, like an interesting map. It's from the World Health Organization from 2016. It looks at age standardized suicide rates um, in just different countries nationwide, I mean, internationally. And basically, um, I think it, it's, if you look at it like around the world, you'll see that like, it really is quite a, you know, a wide variety of different suicidal risk based on where you are in the world. Um, it is hard to compare different nations because it really depends on the record keeping in that in that country. So it's often under like suicide rates are often underreported. They're often stigmatized. So some countries may report that they have very low rates, but that might not be true. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but the you know overall, I would say the incidence of suicide rates tends to be highest in the Baltic countries or the former Soviet bloc region. So Lithuania, um, Kazakhstan, Russia, Latvia, Belarus tend to have very high suicide rates. And also some of the Asian countries like South Korea and India have high suicide rates. Um, a few West African countries, for example, the Ivory Coast has a pretty high suicide rate. Um, some areas that have really low suicide rates tend to be the Caribbean and West Indies, Jamaica, Bahamas and Barbados have very low suicide rates, and also the Middle East tends to have so, um, pretty low suicide rates too. Um, interestingly, right now, the country with the highest suicide rate is Guyana um, in South America, and that one, you know, they have a suicide rate of about 30.2 per 100,000 people, and compared to the U.S., that's, uh, the U.S. is about 30 per 100,000 people. So it's quite a big difference, yeah. So that's something to keep in mind, like what region of the world is the person coming from? And all right, so let's move to the next slide. By the way, if anyone has questions, like <laughs> I think you can uh, raise your hand and I'll unmute you or however that works. Um, all right, so suicide rates around the world. If you look at um, by age and income level of the country, so as you can see, um, the high income countries, which are the blue bars, tend to have lower suicides, but this is by number versus, um, versus the low and middle income countries. So the low and middle income countries account for 79% of suicides in the world. Um, and as you can see, if you look at you know, the lower age groups, the lower and middle income countries have higher suicide rates in the younger age population, whereas if you look at the higher income countries, the suicide rates tend to be higher in middle age and above, so like above 55 years old or above 50 years old. Um, Dr. Ghanem, and we do have a question. Uh, so Dr. Girard is asking, uh, do these rates also apply to immigrants uh, or immigrants in general have a high numbers, high rates? Yeah. Um, so, like, it actually, it's interesting, if you take a look at immigrants, um, they will actually have higher rates than usually their home country. But over time, like, after the first generation or so, like, um, it usually uh, becomes about equal to the rest, of, like, like, the second, like, let's say if they are Asian American, they're coming, like, from China or something, they will have 
a rate that is different than what it is in the, the second generation will have a different rate. But the first generation will even have tend to have an even higher rate than what is in their home country for most um, groups. So, um, and this also like, obviously this, I'm talking about the United States. I don't know what it's like if when people move to other countries or immigrate to other countries. Um, all right, so basically suicide rates in the world account for about 1.4% of all deaths worldwide and they're the 18th leading cause of death. Um, and again, um, suicide rates are higher or tend to occur most often in lower and middle income countries as compared to higher income countries. Um, all right. So I'm going to go to the next section. Um, so I'm going to compare suicide rates around the world based on, again, like whether it's a high income country versus a low and middle income country. So in high income countries, what you see is that there's often a high male to female ratio, whereas in low and middle income countries, the number of males versus females who commit suicide is more equal. So the ratio is smaller. Um, so let's say like in a high income country, the ratio 10 is on average about 3.5 to 1 male to female. And in the lower and middle income country, um, the ratio is about 1.6 to 1. So it's still higher in male, but it's like it's, still, it's a lower ratio. Um, the highest rates in high income countries tend to occur in elderly men, whereas in low and middle income countries, it tends to occur under the age of 30 young adulthood. Um, the means of suicide tends to differ in these to different types of countries. So um, in high income countries, it tends to be firearms, poisoning, or car exhaust. In lower and middle income countries, the means of suicide tend to be pesticide ingestion, which tends to happen a lot in rural areas, hanging, and self immolation um, In high income countries, suicide seems, seems to be more correlated with psychiatric illness. So it is thought, and this is hard to quantify, but based on what we think, um, psychiatric illness is, you know, occurs in about 90% of people who commit suicide in high income countries. Whereas in low and middle income countries, psychiatric illness seems to be less associated. Um, again, it's hard to quantify that because there isn't a lot of, there isn't as much psychiatric care in low and middle income countries. But it seems to be more associated with like economic factors or you know conflict in the family or things like that in lower and middle income countries um and a, a yeah. quick question sorry for interrupting mm -hmm. when you say psych illness is that more of depression or are you thinking of psychosis like schizophrenia and other things um it's it's a combination so um when we look at the breakdown of it 70 percent tends to be a depressive disorder and then the remaining 20% might be something else like a psychotic disorder. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And then in high income countries, the highest risk occurs after um, someone is divorced, separated, or let's say like a widowed man after their spouse dies. Whereas in a low and middle income country, the highest risk, or there definitely is a higher risk in married women than, um, than in um, males, than in um, unmarried women or in married males or unmarried males. The highest risk is actually married women. Um, all right, so now let's talk about the US specifically, suicide rates in the US broken down by race and age. So this is data from 2013. And some takeaway points from this is that um, overall um, white, people and Native Americans tend to have much higher rates of suicide than other groups. Um, so for example, Native Americans um, will tend to have the highest rates of suicide as, at a young age. They're, the Native Americans are the green group. You can see their they're, um, male Native Americans are green and they tend to have the highest suicide rate at a young like adolescence or young adulthood. Um, whereas if you look at like white males, which is the blue group, they tend to have very high rates, but their rates tend to increase as they age. So they have, they have a peak around middle age. And then again, after like age 70, it tends, it goes up again. Um, and then if we look at other groups, so let's say um, black and white women, so white women is the light green, I guess, and black women is the dark purple. 
So if you look, their, their rates are lower and they tend to peak in middle age and then start to go down again as they get older. Um, if you look at black males, which is the lighter purple, they tend to have two peaks, one in young age and then one in older age. Uh, one is a young, you know, a young adult, and then again after age 70. Um, and then if you, you know, those those are white um, American Indians and black. If you look at like Asian, this is not in the chart, but if you look at Asian Americans and Hispanics, they're somewhere in between um, blacks and whites um, so in terms of their suicide rates. Any questions about that? All right, so this is changes in elderly suicide rates or just changes in the demographics of who kills themselves based on age over the years. And overall, like it's important to know that between the um, years of 2000 to 2015 in the United States, suicide rates have increased by about 24%. Um, so they've gone from about 10.5 um, suicides per 100,000 people, per 100,000 deaths and to 13 suicides per 100,000 deaths. So the highest rate was actually recorded um, in 2018. And it, we, I don't have um, any numbers after that, but it, it looks like it's continuing to grow in terms of overall suicide rates in the country. Um, so for many years, the highest rates was in the oldest age cohort, that yellow line, which is the 85 or older, group. And then something happened around 2006, 2007, and the middle age group, which was a 45 to 64, the blue triangle group, they started to overtake the greater than 85 year old group in terms of numbers of suicide. And it's unclear what happened or why that happened, but there are some, you know, theories about that. But if you look like about like 2015 and later, it looks like the two groups are now equal again. So both groups have increased and they're um, the 85 or older group and the 45 to 64 year old group now have about equal rates of suicide. Um, so the theories about why the middle age group sort of caught up with the oldest age group um, is that it might be that there have been, you know, more income inequality, poor economic opportunities, like if these people try to retire, they can't retire. Um, there have been increasing rates of alcohol use and opiate use in this age group. So that might have something to do with it. Um, so those are some theories about why those two groups are now similar. But for many, many years, it really was the oldest age group that had the highest rate of suicide in the U.S. All right. So, so talking about the role of culture and society in suicide rates, it's, you know, there have been several theories about why suicide rates differ based on, you know, what country you're from, based on the race um, you're, you're a part of, the, you know, your, you know, demographic factors. And one of the most popular theories about why suicide rates can differ is this um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development think tank theory. Um, and it says that basically what they think that four fifths of the variance in suicide rates can be, you know, dependent on can really be based on six factors. The rates of divorce in that group, the rates of unemployment, the quality of government, the religious beliefs. So as religiosity increases, suicidality goes down, um, trust in other people and membership in non-religious groups. So obviously more community membership groups cause increased civil society causes um, a decrease in suicide rates. Um, any questions about that? There's so a question, is Dr. Gunay. Uh, the question is from uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Um, Dr. Emmanuel is asking, so what accounts for the high suicide rates in older white male? Is it lack of social support or some other factors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely talk more about that, but uh, definitely it, there does seem to be sort of an increased social isolation that seems to occur in this group. So, I mean, I'll, I'll but we'll definitely, I'll talk more about it. There's more to say about that. Um, 
just in general, like a social integration increases um, and like it tends the suicide rates go down and then it like if there's more social detachment, the suicide rates tend to go up. So, um, and also as like, you know, if there's upheavals in society, let's say there's like upheavals in one's life, like let's say there's retirement, divorce, or the like divorce rates go up, um, or there, there's a big upheaval in society, let's say like a pandemic or something, generally over time, suicide rates go up when there's a big upheaval in society or, you know, the divorce rates go up, something like that. All right. All right, so means of suicide also can have a role in suicide rates. So like, for example, in 20th century England, um, a lot of people used to kill themselves using toxic domestic gas. And the problem was the domestic gas that was piped in to people's homes was very toxic at that time. It was, came from coal rather than natural gas. And so people had a very easy and accessible means of killing themselves. So um, that was, uh, so suicide rates at that time were pretty high in, in 20th century England up until 1960 when they changed the content of the domestic gas. So it became more based on natural gas, it came from natural gas rather than coal. So then suicide rates started to go down. Um, and so if you look at different societies, there are different means of suicide that are preferred in those societies. So in the US it's firearms, in Europe it's hanging, in China, rural China, it's fertilizer poisoning. In large cities like Singapore and Taiwan, it's jumping from buildings. And if you look at like immigrants that move from one culture to another, they will eventually change their suicide me um, methods to those that are dominant in the culture that they move to. So, you know, it really, if, if one is in a particular society and there is like a dominant means of suicide, that is one good way to change or decrease suicide rates. So in the US, presumably, if we decreased access to firearms, likely the suicide rate would go down. Um, there are other examples of this, like let's say in South Korea, a lot of people were jumping off of metro platforms in front of trains, so they erected barriers, and that really seemed to reduce suicide rates. Um, in another period of time, I think it was like in the 90s in England, they a lot of people were trying to kill themselves by overdosing on acetaminophen. So they started to reduce the amount of acetaminophen that could be bought at one time. And that also reduced suicide rates. So that's like um, also very culturally specific and tends to differ based on demographics and country. So that's a, a good target for trying to reduce suicide rates. Okay, so let's talk about like elderly white males in the US or in high income countries in general. Um, so there in the US, the rates of suicide in elderly white males is 20.1 per 100,000 in the men over 85. And that's compared to the overall rate of 13 per 100,000. In elderly white males, there's a very high completion rate. So there's one completed suicide for every four attempted suicides. Whereas like in younger groups, it's like one to one per completed suicide per 25 attempts. Or like in adolescence, it's like one per 100 or something like that. So the, the completion rates in white elderly males is very high. Um, they use highly lethal means like firearms. They're used in 72% of suicides in elderly males in the US. The greatest risk factor for suicide in elderly white males is psychiatric illness and particularly late life depression. And other prominent risk factors are physical illness. And there are particular physical illnesses that are actually like um, tend to increase the risk of suicide higher than others. So malignancy, for example, not like common skin cancers, but other types of malignancies, double the risk of suicide in elderly white males. Um, and then, like the more physical illnesses and conditions you have, the higher the risk of suicide. So like, let's say if you have three, uh, like three chronic conditions, your risk can go up three times for suicide. If you have nine or greater <laughs> like um, conditions, then your risk of suicide will go up um, 10 times. So it really like does accumulate with the number of physical 
um, conditions one has. Um, impairments in IADLs is also a big risk factor. Um, chronic pain is a risk factor. The recent death of a loved one, um, a major change in social roles, so like retirement can be a risk factor. Um, one thing that is less of a risk factor for elderly males, because compared to younger populations, is alcohol. So it tends to play less of a role, but it still plays a role. So like alcohol is involved in 30% 30 per, 30 of suicides in elderly white males. And also one thing that's sort of questionable about whether it plays a role or not is cognitive deficits. So there is some indication that people who have some cognitive deficits are more likely to commit suicide. Um, so for example, if you look at neuropsychological measures of frontal executive functioning, people who are non-suicidal but depressed versus people who are suicidal and depressed, there really is an increase in um, you know, cognitive deficits in frontal executive functioning for those folks as compared to the non-suicidal depressed folks. So there, there might be a role for, you know, cognitive deficits in suicide in the elderly as well. Okay, so why is the suicide rate so high in white elderly men in the United States and other high income countries? So some of these that we already talked about, some of them are like, they're more likely to use lethal means like guns. They're more frail. So if they do attempt to kill themselves, they will likely die versus someone who's younger. Um, they're more likely to live alone. So if they do try to kill themselves, they might not be found quickly enough to be saved. Um, another reason they might have a higher suicide rate is that their depression might not be recognized as quickly in, um, as compared to women, for example. So they're more likely to present with a typical depression, like more physical symptoms rather than the more psychological symptoms. Um, they're less likely to seek out care. They're particularly, they seem to be particularly affected by loss of social status or independence, widowhood, and chronic pain. Um, and then there's also like this you know, cultural paradigm that it's theorized they might be buying into that like aging is a descent into loss and suffering and that suicide is a masculine response to the indignities of aging. So it is possible that there's this paradigm, but you know, it's a theory that, um, that they're more likely to agree with. Um, so for example, I have a picture here of George Eastman. He is the founder of Kodak and he He's the one who basically created personal photography <laughs> for the masses. Um, so he was very prominent and very well known. Um, around the age of 77, he was unable to walk anymore, so he had to use a wheelchair. And around that time, he decided to commit suicide. And the people who wrote about him said he did it because he was unprepared and unwilling to face the indignities of old age. And, you know, some of his biographers said that, you know, that his suicide was a rational, courageous, and powerful choice. He didn't want to deal with the indignities of not being able to walk and not being independent. So if you look at like a lot of the writings about white elderly males who are prominent and who decided to kill themselves, like Ernest Hemingway, for example, it's often written about in that way, that it is like, a triumph over the indignities of aging, and it was a rational choice, a courageous choice. So there does seem to be like a cultural paradigm there for white males. Now let's look at like the opposite spectrum. So the group in the United States with the lowest um, suicide rate is elderly African American women. Why are the rates in this group so low? And the theories behind this is that they may have increased rates of spirituality and, you know, religious community, um, increased sense of community in general. They may be more involved in primary caretaking roles throughout their life cycle, both when they are younger women and as older women. They may take care of children or their parents or, you know, more so than other groups. And definitely like caretaking is protective against suicide. Um, 
there's also that, you know, that cultural paradigm or the socialization that, you know, I can accept immense hardship, I can expect disappointment, this cultural paradigm of the strong black woman. So that might be healthy, helping in some way. It's a stereotype, but it, it might be a factor here in why the rates of suicide are so low. Any questions about that? So my next um, slide is about how can we prevent suicide in the elderly? Like what sort of interventions might be helpful? And there have been several studies about this, um, several interventions that have been tried to see you know, what can be helpful here. One of the interventions, some of the interventions are primary care interventions, like in the primary care clinic. Um, others are community outreach. Others are telephone counseling. And then another type of intervention is trying to improve resilience after adjust after retirement or after like widowhood or something like that. These groups or therapy sessions that can try to improve resilience under those circumstances. So let's talk about primary care intervention. So there are two um, big studies, the impact study and the prospect study. And basically what these two interventions involved was that patients were screened in the primary care clinic for depression and for risk for suicide. Those that were thought to have higher risk were assigned to a care manager. So that could be like a social worker or a psychologist. And that care manager would basically like provide psychoeducation and like frequent follow up and just see how their check ins with them. And this, you know, in both of these studies, this seemed to really help with decreasing suicidal ideation and improving um, depressive symptoms significantly, uh, you know, statistically significant differences. Um, and the control group in these groups were people who also could receive all of these um, counseling and medications, but did not have a, a case manager. Um, so that was one intervention that did seem to be helpful for this group of patients. Um, another intervention that was tried was like a community outreach intervention. This was tried in rural Japan. And basically in um, a certain section or a certain rural area in Japan that had a high suicide rate, what they did was they created workshops about suicide and depression that the whole community was invited to. And then during those workshops, people would take um, sort of a screening or questionnaire. And if they scored high, they would be assigned to an intake with a psychiatrist. And then they would be followed up by a psychiatric nurse. And that seemed to also be effective, but it was primarily effective in women and not so much in men. And there was way more participation by women. Um, and then the third intervention they looked at was telephone counseling. So basically this was done in Italy and it was also done like through, you know, patients were either referred to this sort of intervention either through a social worker or a primary care doctor. And basically if they were thought to be at higher risk, they were given like a crisis number they could call if they felt like they really, they needed assistance. They were also given telephone check-ins every two weeks. And that, uh, that also seemed to be um, helpful as well. It created statistically significant improvements in depressive symptoms and in suicidal ideation. But again, it seemed to be primarily effective in women and not so much in men. Um, the fourth intervention was improving resilience. And this was, um, so basically, one of the interventions was creating a cognitive behavioral therapy group, which was supposed to help um, individuals who had just retired adjust to normal, I guess, to retirement. And um, these people also, after they completed the CBT group sessions, they really did uh, um, have improvements again. And I mean, all these interventions worked for the most part. Um, improvements in depression and improvements in suicidal ideation. And then another similar study that was doing interpersonal therapy. And that was aimed at those who are experiencing social isolation 
Um, it helped them improve their social skills and increasing their social support. And that was effective as well, but mostly more effective in females than males. So um, mostly, like, there seems to be a pattern to a lot of these studies that like um, a lot of them are more effective for women than men. So, so, you know, what are some implications for treatment that we can use from these studies? So it seems that workshops, telephone counseling, and groups may appeal more to women and more to younger, you know, from based on the studies that were done, it, they seem to appeal to younger populations and to women more than to elderly men. Elderly men may prefer more of a, you know, action and problem solving strategies rather than expressing emotion. Um, so it, a primary care case manager may be more effective in reaching older men. So like if you looked at the primary care interventions, they did seem to be more helpful for men than, for, um, than other interventions were. What else, sometimes that can be helpful for men is de-emphasizing the depression label and emphasizing more like their symptoms and how it's affecting their life and various stressors in their life and how to address those stressors rather than like you have depression and you need to treat this depression. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Looks like we don't have new questions, but just uh, like as a reminder, please uh, put your question in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Hi, this is the Emmanuel. I just have uh, uh, just like a comment. I was watching, I was watching a video in um, I think it's in Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, people sign up and they are assigned to like uh, a couple of geriatric patients, like um, like four or five, and they visit the, and and they go visit them at home just to sit with them, chat with them, eat, eat with, have like lunch with them, mm -hmm. and, and 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 a checkup on. Uh, on them, like um, like we're like 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 weekly or so, or like weekly or biweekly, just to have, just to have fun or, or, or go shopping with them and stuff like that to mm -hmm. uh, to decrease uh, loneliness and all this. So and uh, that was that, that was, was very interesting to be helpful for like depression and suicide and stuff like that. Or yeah, and it's, it was mostly for like loneliness. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is also a cause of depression. It is definitely it's so, a big yeah. factor. Yeah. And I find it very, and I find it very, 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 very interesting. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I could. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see that as a particular intervention of like having a companion, or I don't know if it was a companion or a social worker or something like that that went and visited these people. But um, yeah, I didn't see that particular intervention being studied. But it seems like it would help. I mean, it's kind of like the telephone one, where like someone just comes in and checks in on you pretty regularly, but it's in person rather than telephone. It seems like it would be kind of high resource. It would be, take a lot of resources to have someone go and visit someone so like a couple times a, a week or a couple times a month. Um, but yeah, it seems like that would probably be effective. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's look at um, some other future directions that might be helpful. So sometimes, you know, ultimately, Decreasing suicide rates in the U.S. Um, might mean we have to address some of the cultural assumptions we have towards the elderly as a society. So a lot of times our society, we have some assumptions like that depression is a normal part of aging or that aging is necessarily a descent into loss and suffering or that one's value is measured by self-reliance. So if you think about it, if your value is measured by self-reliance, then you know, that's a factor that most elderly people will not, <laughs> you know, they're going to fail that um, because most people as they age will be less self-reliant. And if that's what determines one's value, then we, it means we won't be valuing elderly people as much. And, and there are other ways that maybe as a society, we can look at how to value the elderly. Um, and then, you know, another assumption is that suicide in the elderly is understandable and somehow less of a tragedy. So that is, you know, these are some assumptions that I think sometimes like increase the rate 
of suicide in a population. And I think if we can address some of these, especially in the United States, it might be, it might be helpful. All right, so that's all I've got. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Gunaim. I didn't see any other questions. So.